For today's lesson, I want to skip ahead a little bit in your textbook, and we're going to look at polycyclic and heterocyclic rings. These polycyclic and heterocyclic rings are characterized by having what are called bridgehead positions. A bridgehead position is a point where two rings intersect. So for example, in this compound right here, this these are what we call fused ring systems, and the point of ring fusion is called the bridgehead carbon. So this is a bridgehead carbon right here. Um, for these other ones, let's pull this over into ChemDraw. And we'll take a look at where those bridgehead positions are. The instructions tell me to drop a circle around them. So this one right here is a bridgehead position. It's essentially where the two rings come together. This compound here on the third one also has a fairly straightforward bridgehead position. You'll notice that kind of looks like both rings intersect right here at this position. This compound has two different bridgehead positions. So the point of contact between the two triangles occurs right here and then again right here. And this one is even more complicated. You can sort of see a ring system. This is a six-membered ring that goes up here. And then there's another six-membered ring that goes around the outside. And then if you want, you can also think about another six-membered ring that goes right here. And the one thing that all, all three of those proposed rings have in common is they share this carbon and then this carbon out here on the end. So this represents the bridgehead position. It's the point where the two rings or the three rings or the four rings, however many rings your system has, it's where some of those rings come together. What you've noticed in this circling pattern is that either the bridgehead position, either there's one bridgehead position or there's two bridgehead positions. And if we kind of sort those right here, so I'm going to put the one bridgehead positions right there, and then the two bridgehead positions together right here. The one bridgehead fuse or a polycyclic ring system is referred to as a spirocyclic ring. So these are the two. So it was compound number one and compound number three. Those end up being spirocyclic compounds and spirocyclic compounds have one bridgehead position. When you are fused together, if a ring system is fused together at multiple points, then that becomes a polycyclic ring system. And they can be bicyclic or tricyclic or tetracyclic, etc. We're only going to focus on bicyclic ring systems and spirocyclic ring systems. If we were to come up with more useful names of things, which you've noticed we don't, we would call these uh, kind of unicyclic ring systems because they have one bridgehead position and a bicyclic ring system that has two bridgehead positions. I think now we can add in the definitions right here. A spirocyclic compound uh, is a situation or a compound. So it's a compound where two rings share a single bridgehead position. We're going to have a better definition of bicyclic compounds in just a second, but the spirocyclic compounds, this works, where when you look and you have two fused rings and they share a single position, that's spirocyclic. So far, all we've identified is spirocyclic and polycyclic. We're going to subdivide that up into bicyclic, tricyclic, tetracyclic right now. And this has to do, the, the way that they decide if something is bicyclic or tricyclic has to do with the bond cutting criteria. So this example right here, we're going to pull this over into ChemDraw. This was one of those compounds that we just evaluated. It's um, this one right here. When you want to determine, so once you've identified that there are multiple bridgehead positions, you now know that the compound is not spirocyclic. The spirocyclic compounds have the one bridgehead, and we're not really interested in those right now. What we're looking at are these other two compounds that have multiple bridgehead positions. And in order to classify these as monocyclic or, sorry, as bicyclic or tricyclic, we follow what's called the bond cutting criteria. And this uh, bond cleavage criteria sometimes is called. It's based on the concept of how many times do I have to cut 
this system in order to open up every single ring. And so this is one potential way of cutting it. If I cut this bond right here, and I cut this bond right here, then I can generate this system. And so because it took two cuts in order to open this up into a system that has no rings whatsoever, this is referred to as a bicyclic system. There's actually two other ways of cutting it. We can cut it here, or we can cut it here. There's more than two. Um, and this would end up producing, if we were to cut it in those two positions, then it would still open up all the rings. Okay? So if I cut here and here, then this is the resulting compound. Notice that I've broken all the ring systems. And the second criteria is that you can't have loose fragments hanging around. Um, for example, if I were to have cut instead of where I cut right here, if I were, let's, let's copy and paste that down. This one actually, if I cut it like that, it produces this system. If the original cuts that I made looked more like, let's see, it wasn't this one, to go back. Um, these were the two cuts that I made in order to generate this system. We can come up with other cutting arrangements. Let me show you one that works, another one that works, and then I'll show you one that doesn't work. So instead of cutting it here and here, you can cut it um, here and here. And again, those two cuts and any two cuts work to establish that this is a bicyclic ring system. Those two cuts break apart every single ring in the system, but don't cut it up into multiple fragments. So it doesn't matter here that this is branched. I've gotten rid of all the rings. I've gotten rid of all the rings in all three of these. This just shows over and over again that this is a bicyclic system. If you had tried to cut it a third time, let's say that for whatever reason you didn't like this one, and you cut it a third time, whoops, that's, uh, we cut it right there as well, then what you'd end up with is uh, a little carbon just kind of hanging out all by itself right over here. Okay, so you would end up cutting that piece off. So this only works if you cut every single ring system so that there's no more ring systems, but you don't uh, kind of have a straggler that falls off of the compound. So this third pattern that I came up with right here is incorrect. Oops, okay. Now let's use those same criteria and decide what kind of system this is. And so if you'll notice, when I first kind of pointed this out to you, there were the two bridgehead positions, this one right here and this one right here. And then I kind of pointed out, well, there's a six-membered ring right here that goes all the way around the outside. There's a six-membered ring that you can kind of see across the top. And then there's a six-membered ring that goes across the bottom. So if you don't follow the rules that I'm showing you, you could mistakenly think that this was a tricyclic system. It's not, because if I cut this one right here, and I cut this one right here, then the resulting um, structure looks like this. I'll go ahead and drag that arrow down. And I'm going to cut those two bonds. And what you'll notice is there's no more rings in the system. And all of the pieces are still connected together. If you tried to cut a third time, then you would have disconnected it and had two separate pieces. And that's uh, against the rules of this particular criteria, is you need only the number of cuts that it takes to get rid of all the ring systems. And if you end up with different piles of atoms that are not connected to each other, then you've cut it too many times. So I went ahead and moved the answers over. The question A asked us to use dashed lines to indicate where the cuts were made in the following polycyclic alkane and so to get from here to here those are the two cuts that I would need to make and because it required two cuts in order to open up all the ring systems without carving it up into too many fragments then this was just a bicyclic ring system and here are the two different ways that existed for cutting this alkane above and still producing kind of this non-cyclic alkane so this is just three different ways of demonstrating how this is a bicyclic system The next question gives us three different examples and asks which one of these following patterns is correct and what's wrong with the other two. And for the top one up here, um, let's actually just move this over to ChemDraw and do my typing in there. 
and we can go ahead and show arrows of what those fragmentation patterns will look like and this is kind of the best way to answer the question and if I follow through with those cuts that have been proposed then what I end up with is cutting all three of these right there and this is wrong because we have overcut uh, now we have too many fragments there's two fragments and that's too many you should only end up with one fragment when you're all done over here on this second one we have undercut if you look at the resulting compound and we cut this middle bond right here then this is an undercut because we still have a, a ring inside of the system still have a ring so because the question stipulated that one of them must be correct we can assume that it's this one but let's check anyway if I cut that bond that bond and that bond just like the question is asking then notice how I don't have any more rings in the system and I all of my original atoms are still tethered together in kind of one pattern it doesn't matter if that pattern has branches or not but it can't be two separate piles of atoms see everything has to be still tied together so this one is correct and because it required three cuts then we know that this is a tricyclic system which I don't remember if that's what the question asks but um, even if it doesn't, it's worth noting. All right, we'll go ahead and just chop that one out. Okay, so which one of the following patterns is correct and what's wrong with the other two? So I've identified that this one is correct, and then I've identified that the other two are incorrect. I've implied that by saying it's overcut or undercut, and then we say why. It's too many fragments here and still have a ring, and that's fantastic use of the English language right there. So how many rings do each of the alkanes above contain? Well, actually, let's just build that right into our answer. Um, and so going back up here, and I'll even fix that. Makes me feel better. So this right here, if I overcut it, that means it should only have two cuts. And it should only have two cuts, which equals a bicyclic system. So if you have to cut it twice, then it's bicyclic. Once it's monocyclic and three times it's tricyclic, etc. Still have a ring in the second one, and so needs another cut. Two total cuts, which is what you need, would also equal bicyclic. So this is a bicyclic system, correct, and it's tricyclic, um, and so three cuts equals tricyclic. And there we kind of have both uh, the answers and a little better explanation. And the English got a little better. So now I'm just going to take those, and I've kind of completed all the answers for this one now. The next question asks us to go through that exercise one more time. Uh, because uh, repetition hopefully influences learning. So we'll kind of bring all these over and then we're going to show where the cuts are and show the resulting structures. So I kind of prep everything and now I'm going to start making my cuts. And again, there's a variety of different ways that you can do this. I can make a cut here and the second cut that I can make, so that opened up this ring system. I can make a cut on any one of these other four positions right here and it would open up the other ring system. So we can do something like that. And the resulting structure of that, and we just kind of clip this one out and we cut that one out and because it took two cuts, then it's bicyclic. For the next one, I can I have an outer six-membered ring. This is very similar to one of the other compounds we've already looked at. So I can cut it here, and um, then I have to cut any one of these bonds up here. So we can cut, let's cut this one right here. And then we'll clip those out. And the reason I'm clipping it is now to make sure that I don't have any rings left in the system and there's no free-floating fragments. And so because two cuts was sufficient to do this, it's still a bicyclic compound. And this one down here, I'm going to cut it right there. That opens up this six-membered ring. And then I'll cut it right here, and that opens up my other six-membered ring. So all three of these are bicyclic systems. 
And that wasn't really, it's just a lack of creativity on my part when I was coming up with these questions that I didn't give you something tricyclic or tetracyclic, but the idea stays the same, that you just kind of look at, explore the different cuts that you need to make in order to open up all the available ring systems. And once you've made all of the appropriate cuts, you double check to make sure you haven't overcut it and all the fragments are still connected together by at least one bond, and then we should have our correct answer. So double little check the question, how many rings do each of the following compounds, can do each of the following alkanes contain? So I didn't say the number of rings, but by saying bicyclic, that means there's two rings. So they all have two rings. Show your bond cuts with dashed lines and draw your resulting non-cyclic alkanes. And you might have cut different bonds and still gotten to the same answer. And that would be an equally correct response to this question. If you cut it um, a different way and came up with a different answer, then uh, you made a mistake. You or I made a mistake, but it's definitely you. Now let's think about how we name these compounds. And the problem with naming these is how do you decide what the parent chain is? And this is specifically, we're going to look at bicyclic compounds. We're not going to do nomenclature for tricyclic or tetracyclic compounds, etc. Just bicyclic compounds. And then we'll come back and look at how the nomenclature is unfortunately very different for spirocyclic compounds. So we take this example right here. So I've given you one example of a compound where I have correctly numbered the parent chain. So this is how you should number the parent chain. And we'll kind of unpackage the rules here to figure out what that tells us about numbering these two compounds right here. Notice the number one carbon shows up on one of the bridgehead positions. And because this molecule is perfectly symmetrical, it really doesn't matter which of those two bridgehead positions I refer to as the number one carbon. So I'm going to call the bridgehead. This is a bridgehead, and then this is the other bridgehead. One of those two ends up with the number one position. So I can go and assign this number one to this compound over here. And it, again, it doesn't, for these particular molecules, it does not matter which bridgehead position you choose. Later on, it'll be an issue. Then we don't go to the next carbon. We don't go to the bridgehead, the other bridgehead next. So it wouldn't go one and then two, and it wouldn't go one and then two. What you'll notice is we start walking across one of these bridges. And that's why it's called a bridgehead carbon. A bridgehead carbon is where we then look at the bridges that connect one bridgehead carbon to another. And you choose the next route based on the longest possible bridge. So notice how I call this the number one carbon, and the other bridgehead carbon is over here. To get from this bridgehead position, number one, to carbon number six, I can either cross one, two, three, four, that's a, three, a four carbon bridge, or I can cross a one, two, three carbon bridge, or I can cross a one carbon bridge. And for bicyclic ring systems, you get across the biggest bridge first. So to go from here to this other position, my bridges either have four carbons, or three carbons, or zero carbons. So I'm gonna go ahead and go across the biggest, the biggest bridge first. And then you, then you should get back to another bridgehead position, and then you just keep walking, but now you're walking on the second largest bridge. And finally, and, and then we walk across the third bridge. So it's almost as if the first bridgehead carbon kind of gets skipped over in numbering when we go across that third bridge. So for this compound over here, let's see, to get from here to here, there's either a two carbon bridge or a two carbon bridge or a three carbon bridge. Three carbon bridge is the longest bridge. That's the one we walk across first. So numbering this would be one, two, three, four. And then we have a five. And then we just, because both of these bridges are the same, we're gonna keep walking across them, kind of continuing the circle and now we have to cross that last bridge. So we kind of slide through the original bridgehead position. We leave it with its original number one and kind of skip our numbering. And we come across and call this number eight and this number nine. So this is how we would name, sorry, this is how we would number those different bridgehead positions. Sorry, the different carbons in the bicyclic ring system. 
Now that we've come up with the numbering system, then we kind of have to fill in a couple more pieces. The total number of carbons in the ring system specifies the parent name. So for this example compound over here that had 10 total carbons, it's called a bicyclodecane. Given that information, we should recognize that the name of compound A right here, which has nine total carbons in the bicyclic system, is some type, it's a bicyclo, whoops, non-ane. And compound B also has nine carbons, so it is also a bicyclo non-ane. You'll notice that while both of these have the same parent chain name, they definitely don't look the same. These are different molecules. They're constitutional isomers of each other. And so there needs to be more detail in the name that allows us to know which of these is one bicyclonanane and which of them is the other bicyclonanane. And that's what we're going to look at next. So you should have come up with the same parent name for compound A and compound B. Well, good. We didn't mess up yet. While these compounds have the same parent name, they have different types of bridges. Bridges refer to the different pathways that connect the two bridgehead carbon. So we have an example here. So this was, I'm going to repeat this same example right here that had 10 carbons. So this was some type of bicyclodecane. That makes it easier to find those when I want them. So this bicyclodecane right here, we're going to call this first bridge, bridge number one, and that's the largest bridge. The second largest bridge is bridge number two, and the third bridge is bridge number three. So there's three bridges in this example compound right here. Then we would ask, well, how many bridges are in compound A, and how many bridges are in compound B? In compound B, it's easy to see the three bridges. Uh, two, three, and four represent the carbons of one of the bridges. Carbons six and seven represent the carbons in the second bridge, and carbons eight and nine represent the carbons in the third bridge. So compound B definitely has three bridges. Compound A also has three bridges. Carbons two, three, four, and five represent the carbons in the first bridge. Seven, eight, nine represent the carbons in the second bridge. And this is a bridge that doesn't have any carbons, but it's still a bridge. So both of these compounds have three bridges. So you should have observed the same number of bridges in both of these compounds. Now what we do in order to differentiate between uh, these two compounds is we're going to name, we're going to add to the name how many carbons are in the three bridges. So in the example compound that we saw before, this is a bicyclodecane. It's a decane because we saw that it has 10 carbons. Um, and it has three bridges, and so the first bridge has four carbons. That's this bridge right here, one, two, three, four. The second bridge has three carbons, one, two, three, and the third bridge has one carbon, one. The numbers associated with each of those three bridges are listed in descending order, separated by periods, and surrounded by square brackets. So we kind of brought out a weird type of punctuation for this one. So there's some example compounds below. In fact, you'll notice that this compound right here matches compound A, and this compound over here matches compound B. So we're not leaving those compounds behind. We'll just start off with those. So let's come up with the names for this one. And it would be helpful if we attached some labels to these. So we'll just call this one A. This one becomes letter B. This one is C and D. All right. OK, so compound A. We've seen compound A before, and we know that it has nine carbons in the parent chain. So it's some type of bicyclonane. If you look at the example compound, notice how the brackets and those three numbers slide in between the bicyclo and the nane. And so it's going to look something like this. <laughs> Autocorrect did not like bicyclo. And so I'm not going to fill in those brackets yet, but let's go ahead and finish out B and C. Letter B has these two bridgehead positions right here. 
the longest bridge has one, sorry, I'll just count it. This is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So letter B is also some type of bicyclonane. The purpose of this question is, in part, to show you how important those numbers in brackets are. And the reason why the numbers in brackets should matter to you in this question is I believe they're all going to be bicyclonanes of some flavor or another. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, um, all of these are some type of bicyclonanane. And you'll see that if you were to just leave the name as bicyclonanane, you wouldn't know which of these four you're talking about. And that's why identifying how many carbons are in each bridge is a big deal. For the first one, when you figure out how many carbons are, each, are in each bridge, you do not count the bridgehead positions. So skipping this one, there are one, two, three, four carbons. And then the next bridge would have one, two, three carbons. And the last bridge would have zero. And yes, you do enter a zero. So this should have three numerical values, even if one of them is a zero. Uh, could you have a case where they're all zeros? No, no, that wouldn't work like that. For the next one, from this bridge all the way over, there are one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. The other bridge has one carbon, and that last bridge has zero carbons. What you'll notice is the sum of these three numbers will always be two less than the number of carbons that the parent chain specifies because we don't count the parent we don't count the bridgehead carbons in this. So four plus three is seven. Nonane tells me I should have nine carbons, and the fact that these add up to be two less than the number that this name specifies is consistent across the board. So I need a I need three numbers right here. They should add up to be seven. We skip the bridgehead. There are one, two, three, four, five, and then there are two, and then there are zero, 5.2.0. And the last one is four, no, sorry, three. So one, two, three carbons, and then a bridge with two carbons, and then a bridge with two carbons. So this one is 3.2.2. The only combination, well, I guess there's probably some other combinations that we haven't considered yet. Uh, six, or sorry, 5.1.1 would be a combo that you should be able to draw. Um, 4.2.1 would be another combination that you could draw. I'm just coming up with numbers that add up to seven. So that's how creative I'm being. These represent different constitutional isomers of each other, and this one is A and B and C and D. Let me show you what one of those other numbers that I was thinking of would look like. So again, what's common about all four of these compounds is that the numbers in brackets add up to be seven. So 4 plus 3 is 7, 6 plus 1, 5 plus 2, 3 plus 2 plus 2. You could also envision a case where it's 4 plus 2 plus 1. That adds up to be 7. So a compound named bicyclo 4.2.1 uh, nonane should exist. We should be able to draw that. So we're going to start off with a bridgehead carbon. And we're going to go across four carbons. One, there's So there's the bridgehead. 1, 2, three and four and then we're going to come to the next bridgehead so given this name there's one two three four carbons between those two bridgeheads and then i have to go across two more carbons one two and back to the other bridgehead and then we have one carbon and back to the bridgehead again i'll clean this up just a tad so that's what bicyclo 421 non-aim would look like and we can double check from this bridgehead there are one, two, three, four carbons to get back to the bridgehead, and then two carbons to get back to the bridgehead, and then one carbon to get back to the bridgehead. I don't know if ChemDraw names these correctly or not. Oh, it does. Oh, good. Um, when we start adding substituents on this, that's when ChemDraw starts to diverge from your textbook. So for now, uh, ChemDraw, as long as it's a simple bicyclic ring system, then ChemDraw can give you the right answer. All right, so now let's start, let's start putting substituents on this. But we've already done most of the hard work because unlike other alkanes that we've named in the past, the numbering system on this one is based on the bridgehead carbons. So for this compound right here, even though I have substituents now, a methyl group and an ethyl group, hanging off of the ring system, I still have to call one of the bridgehead carbons the number one position. And from that bridgehead position, I have to then go across the largest ring first. 
So the addition of the substituent, the only complexity that it adds is now I have to be more careful when I choose which bridgehead carbon is carbon number one. In this case, by calling this bridgehead carbon carbon number one, that means I got to a methyl group by the time I was at the third carbon. If instead I had randomly called this bridgehead position, the first carbon, carbon number one, then I wouldn't have gotten to the methyl group until the fourth position, and that would be wrong. The first position that you encounter, you want that to be the lowest number possible. So this represents the correct name for this compound. So now we have uh, these four different compounds and these four names. We can kind of mix and match them together. This would be a good time for you to pause the video and try to come up with these on your own and do that now. All right, hopefully you're back with some correct answers. Let's, I'm gonna just move this over to ChemDraw so it's easier for me to organize these in the right place. Um, all of these are some type of octane. And in fact, all of them are a bicyclo 3 to one octane. So I don't have to worry about trying to figure out what the parent chain name is. The multiple choice nature of this question doesn't require that. But let's go through it at least one time. There's a bridgehead carbon and there's a bridgehead carbon. From this bridgehead to that bridgehead, the longest possible route would take me across three carbons. The next longest route will take me across two carbons, and the last route will take me across one carbon. So it's always gonna be a three, and then a two, and then a one. So if I call this the number one position right here, then the ethyl group would show up at the number two position. If I call this the number one position, I still have to go across the largest bridge first, so that wouldn't give me my ethyl group until I got to the four position. So that means that this needs to be the number one carbon. The ethyl group will be at the two position. There's three, four, five, takes me right back to my other bridgehead, and then I continue numbering this across the next largest uh, bridge, so that'd be six and seven. So this would be a two ethyl, 7-methyl bicyclo 3 2, one octane That'd be the correct name for this compound right here. For this one, my bridgehead position is going to be either up top, and I have to number across the largest ring first. So I don't get to, I don't, I don't want to move towards that ethyl group because it's not in the largest ring. So if I call this the number one position, then I would not encounter my methyl group until I get to number four. If instead I call this the number one position, then the methyl group shows up at the two position. That would be three, four, five, and we still have to go across the next largest ring, six, seven, and then finally we get to the ethyl group at number eight. So it'll be this one right here. Uh, and then once you identify the numbers of these, you alphabetize them. That's why ethyl is before methyl in all of these examples. For this one, uh, this is gonna be the number one position because the methyl group is directly tethered to it. If I tried to call this the number one position, then I wouldn't encounter my first substituent until the number three. And you always wanna make sure your first substituent gets the lowest number possible. So this would be one, two, three. So there's the methyl group at the one position and the ethyl group at the three position. So hopefully this one's right. Uh, if I call this the number one position, then it's two, three, four, five, six. The ethyl group shows up at the six position uh, so at the six, I have an ethyl group, and at the seven, I have a methyl group. If instead I start up on this one, then I encounter the methyl group at the six position and the ethyl group at the seven position. When you end up with the same numbering system, six and seven or six and seven, regardless of which way you go around the ring system, then we have to figure out which way to go so that we um, encounter the highest priority alphabetic substituent with the lowest number possible. So 6E is better than 6M, so that's why I went this way on that one. Okay. Um, man, this is gonna be a mess to port back over. So I'm just gonna let you guys fill in that part of the lesson plan. So you can just draw lines to the right answers right here. Um, this was the 67 one right here, that's the first one. And this was the ethyl group at the two position, so it would be the third one. This is the methyl group at the two position, so that'd be the fourth one. And this one would be the methyl group at the one position, so that's the second one. Now, if this lesson stopped right here, then you would know how to name bicyclic compounds and there would be no confusion. The problem with spirocyclic compounds 
is that they are named with similar rules but not the same. And so it is the combination of bicyclic and spirocyclic that presents the challenge to the learner. So rise to the challenge. Other motivational things I should say. So we have here three different examples and we want to think about how we've named these examples. Well the part that's the same is the number of carbons inside of the fused ring systems dictates that last part of the parent chain name. So there's my bridge head. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons means that this is an octane. You'll notice that it's a spiro and then brackets and then octane, and that shouldn't be too surprising. The last one was bicyclo and then brackets and then whatever the parent chain was. Any substituents that are coming off of it go all the way out in front. So this is an ethyl spiro octane. That part should be fairly easy. Then you'll notice that there are only two numbers in the brackets. And that makes sense because you only have two total bridges in a spirocyclic compound. But the part that's difficult is that those bridges are listed in ascending order in spirocyclic compounds. So in bicyclic compounds, it would have been a five and then a two and then some third number. In spirocyclic compounds, you put the smallest number first and then the largest number and there's not a third number. So this is two five and two two and three three. And uh, because they're the same size, you wouldn't have noticed that. That's why this example is important. It shows us that now in spirocyclic compounds, the numbers go in ascending order. So uh, how does naming of spirocyclic compounds differ from bicyclic compounds in terms of numbering the bridges for spirocyclic compounds? numbers are listed in ascending order. Oh, that's the, sorry, that's the first one, the order the number in the brackets. So we'll drop that in here. Next thing let's look at is numbering the bridgehead carbon. So let's focus on this compound right here. In a bicyclic ring system, the bridgehead carbon was the number one position. But you'll notice in the name down here, that it tells us that it's a 1,2 dimethyl. That means that the methyl group is the number one position. And that's true. For spirocyclic compounds, the bridgehead carbon is numbered on the way back through. Or in other words, the number one carbon will always be one carbon over from the bridgehead position. So this is the number one carbon, and then two, and then three, and then we number the bridgehead position on the way back through. So numbering of the bridgehead carbon, probably the simplest way to say this is it's never equal to one. And you number the bridgehead on the way back through, if that makes any sense. Um, if you rewind the video, which you don't need to, but when I talked about the numbering of this thing and I counted the, the carbons in the parent chain, I did not call this one. I started here. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Or at least I should have. Maybe I didn't. Who knows? All right. So numbering the bridgehead carbon is different in spirocyclic compounds. And then finally, numbering the bridges. So for this one right here, the numbering of this one goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that explains why there's methyl groups at the one and the two and the methyl at the five. For this one, I can't call the bridgehead carbon number one. I have to call one of these two positions number one. I call this position number one over here because that's where the ethyl group is and the ethyl group alphabetically comes before the methyl. So this goes one, two, three. And then we treat this ring as if we're starting all over again and we just look to go whichever direction gives us the highest, sorry, the first substituent first. So one, two, three, and then four. That's where the methyl group is. You wouldn't go one, two, three, four, five because you want to get to the methyl group as quickly as possible. It's this compound over here that allows us to answer this third question. What you'll notice is that we don't get to the ethyl group until we get to the fifth carbon. And the way we do that is we actually number across the smallest bridge first. So it goes one, two, three, and then once we get back to the bridgehead, now we go whichever route, as this could be four or this could be four, 
whichever one gets us to a substituent as quickly as possible. So that's why it's this is 4 and this is 5 and 6, 7, 8. So what's different about this one in spirocyclic compounds, you want to number the smaller bridge first. Okay, uh, there should be something that tells you to name this compound. So let's name them. Based on the rules that we've just seen, we should be able to come up with names for these three compounds. The first thing we want to do is recognize that these are spirocyclic compounds. So this is going to be spiro um, bracket. Oops. And then the number of total carbons will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So this is some type of spironane. The bridges from the bridgehead back to itself goes across 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 1, 2, 3, 4. With bicyclic compounds, the sum of these three numbers in bicyclic compounds added up to be one less, sorry, two less than the name suggested. So the name told you you had eight carbons, then these should add up to be six because a bicyclic compound has two bridgeheads. Spirocyclic compounds only have one bridgehead, so the sum of these numbers will always be one less than the name suggests. So if you have a nonane, these should add up to be eight. Now, coming off of the spirocyclic compound, I have both an ethyl group and an isopropyl group. I don't know, I'm not going to worry about the numbers of those yet, but I will put them in alphabetic order. Ethyl is alphabetized according to the letter E, and isopropyl is, as, is alphabetized by the letter I because that's not a numeric designation. Because the ethyl group is going to come alphabetically first, if there's a tie, I want to get to the ethyl group as quickly as possible. And there is a tie. These two rings are both the same size, so the size of the ring allows me to choose any one of these four carbons to be carbon number one. And that's just because the rings are the same sizes. Over here, the rings are not the same sizes. This ring is smaller, and so I've got to go across that ring first. But over here, they're the same size. So I'm going to try to get to that ethyl group as quickly as possible. And it comes at the, this is the one carbon, and that's the two carbon. If I try to get to the isopropyl group, the best I can do is put it at the two position as well. And because ethyl alphabetically comes before isopropyl, when the numbers are the same, then the ethyl group gets priority. So this is a 2-ethyl, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then I want to get to the isopropyl group as quickly as possible, 6 and 7. So it's 2-ethyl, 7-isopropyl. The next compound, it's going to be a spiro, something, something, non-aim. Nope, I don't even know what it is yet. There are 1, 2, 3 carbons over here, and then 3 other carbons over here. So this is going to be some type of spirohexane. Um, this compound over here, notice how it has the same basic structure. And so it's also going to be a spirohexane. In the brackets, I want to get across the smallest bridge first. So from this bridgehead, I cross one, two stepping stones, and then I'm right back at the bridgehead again. And then I cross one, two, three stepping stones, and I'm back at the bridge again. So this is a two, three. Notice that they're periods and not commas, and therefore this would also be a two, three. I need the number across the smallest bridge first. So I'm going to go across here. I can call this the number one position, or I can call this the number one position. But since the isopropyl group is here, this will be carbon number one, and then two, three, and four. So this is going to be a four ethyl. 1-isopropyl. Now this is different than the previous compound because in the previous compound I wanted to get to the ethyl as quickly as possible. And that was because both of these rings were the same size and both the ethyl group and the isopropyl group were at the two position of their respective rings. So alphabetization only mattered because it was a 2 or it was a 2 either way. Here I didn't care about alphabetization because I had to go across the smaller ring first. And this is the same case, um, well, actually a little different over here. This last one, oh, that's where the name went. It's down here. I'm also going to have some type of ethyl and then some type of isopropyl. Okay. 
I'm going to number across the smallest ring first. So the pattern will be either a 1, 2, or a 1, 2. Because the numerical pattern is the same, going either direction, then I have to use alphabetic preference. Ethyl has higher priority than isopropyl alphabetically, so it's going to go 1 ethyl, 2 isopropyl. Let's just do this. A little cleaner this way. So those are the three names for these compounds right here for spirocyclic nomenclature. Um, I made this document a long time ago, and at the time I thought it was really cool that everybody should know they're heterocyclic compounds and you should memorize these, and then I realized that I kept forgetting what they were. So the only one of these heterocyclic compounds that I expect you to remember the name of is this compound called THF. These heterocyclic compounds are defined by the presence of a heteroatom. And so this is just a little bit of vocabulary that doesn't necessarily line up with any one of the questions, but something that you need to remember that a heteroatom is equal to not carbon or hydrogen. That's not a technically correct definition, but it is by far the most useful definition of that term. So if a ring system has something inside of the ring system that's not carbon or hydrogen, then that is a heteroatom. Oxygen's a heteroatom, nitrogen's a heteroatom. And therefore these ring systems are referred to as heterocyclic. These show up quite a bit, and if you were doing the laboratory portion of the course, then you would encounter a solvent called THF. THF is short for tetrahydrofuran. It's a nice solvent. It tends to dissolve nonpolar substances very well, but because of the presence of the oxygen, it also tends to dissolve polar substances as well. So it kind of it, it will dissolve a lot of things, and that's why we like to use it. So THF is just tetrahydrofuran. Both pyrrolidine, so this is pyrrolidine, and piperidine are able to dissolve many polar and nonpolar solutes. So that's a good solvent system, but are less common as solvents because of their base properties. Why do these heteroatoms act as stronger bases than THF? Well, the comparison that we care about, this is a review of a previous concept, is given oxygen versus nitrogen, the nitrogen is a stronger base because it is less electronegative. A base has two jobs. The first job of a base is to summon electron density both the oxygens and the nitrogens in these compounds have a lone pair. So they've done their first job. They have an electron density in the, in, the form, sorry, in the form of that lone pair. The next job is to throw those electrons at something. That's what a base does. It donates its electrons to something. And because nitrogen is less electronegative, it is better at tossing its electrons at something. So that makes it a better base. If you don't like that definition, then remember base strength and acid strength are inversely related. Oxygen and nitrogen are in the same row of the periodic table. The oxygen produces a stronger acid. Therefore, it will produce a weaker conjugate base. And that's really all this question was intended to review. For the rest of the problems, you just need to come up with these your answers to these textbook problems. They're nomenclature questions. And then you want to name these compounds right here. This is, these are both bicyclic compounds. This is a spirocyclic compound with a lot of common name substituents. You also need to name these two compounds down here, and I took these out of the ChemDraw 3D. And so you'll kind of need to try to model what these look like in your mind, maybe draw them out on a piece of paper and then try to name them. But these are both uh, bicyclic compounds. Yeah, yep, both bicyclic compounds. Let's go up and finish our definitions. A bice, so we had the spirocyclic compound, it's where two rings share a single bridgehead position. Bicyclic compounds are um, ring system that is fully opened with two cuts. So the definition of bicyclic compounds, we want to make sure that we incorporate that ring cutting definition. And a heterocyclic compound is a ring system with a heteroatom, so with uh, not carbon or hydrogen in the ring. Uh, I know another way of saying that, it is a ring system with a heteroatom 
and I can put a few examples of hetero atoms. Oxygens, nitrogens, and sulfur are by far the most common hetero atoms that we encounter in organic chemistry.